So tonight I want to welcome our special guest, and that is um, Gary Moritz from uh, City United Church in Lunenburg, Massachusetts, and he is the Church Revitalization Director at the Baptist Convention of New England. So Gary, welcome. Hey, everybody. It's great to be with you. Thanks, Sandy. All How's right. How's everybody doing? You're gonna, I'm going to disappear, and Gary's going to jump right in. Awesome. Well, this is great. I'm actually tuning in uh, from Kansas City, and it's pretty cool out here, literally cool. Uh, it was hot, and now all of a sudden it's cold here. And uh, I'm actually here for um, a brainstorming session in the metaverse. And so that's probably a different webinar for later, uh, but really dealing with the Oculus and discipleship and theology and all that cool stuff. And um, it's just a, a real joy to be with you, but it really brings back great memories because I'm a big jazz fanatic. I love jazz music. And this is one of the places where jazz kind of started in America. And uh, not only with jazz, but also this is where you get some pretty good barbecue sauce. And so I'm a vegan, so I don't really eat meat, but I definitely will put some of that Jack Stack barbecue sauce on my food, especially during this summer months. And so I want to welcome all of you who are jumping in just this last minute to maximizing uh, your summer in church revitalization. And so if you do me a favor, just go on and just put up in the chat where you're from. And uh, I just like to know that for my own sake and how I can pray for you. And this is just going to be a great practical time. Uh, this webinar is not necessarily theological, but it's more practical. Uh, we are facing um, summer, and jokingly, I think summer for us in New England was on Saturday last year. I can't really remember, but uh, I know it, it's really short, it feels like. And so, you know, summer, when we're talking about summer, summer means many things to different people. And so, you know, when I was in junior high, it would mean freedom, right? Remember that day, the last day of school where it was like, you didn't have to go to school anymore and you had three whole months to kind of just ride your bike and kind of do whatever you wanted to do. And then when I was in high school, it meant working a job and, uh, you know, providing for myself. But I just remember, you know, elementary school, summer, I've got three months to maximize of riding my bike and playing with my army men and uh, doing all that fun things that kids like to do. But however, years later, as a pastor, I'm thinking, man, summer means something else to me. And it really means how to maximize my three months, how to get the most out of my three months. How can I revitalize and get things moving ahead over these three months? And so summer in New England, it means that we get sunshine, right? Can I get an amen in the chat? We get some sunshine. Uh, we get to see some amazing sunsets. We get longer nights. Uh, we get to have gathering opportunities like never before. We get to enjoy connections that maybe we kind of missed out in our local communities because maybe it was too cold or it was snowing. And, and now we can kind of open up and then they'll forget vacations, right? People take vacations. But summer, I, I want to help you, is also a clear pathway into the fall. And so if you plan your summer correctly, you can have a really good harvest time in the fall. And so when you talk to different people, some people say, hey, summer, it can be a really hard time to revitalize our church as revitalizers because this is where we want to kind of maybe sit back and kind of rest and relax. And I think resting and relaxing is good and you should schedule that in, but you shouldn't coast through the summer. You should really be thinking ahead to the fall because it's going to come really, really fast. And that will be another webinar that I lead in in August. And we'll talk more about that later. But, you know, when you look at the summer, you, you, you have to realize the summer is not something to get through. It's something to work through. And it's not just about getting through the summer, but working through the summer in intensity and having intensity saying, OK, how are we going to reach more people? How are we going to evangelize? What are we going to do differently in the summer that we necessarily can't do in the fall or we can't do during the winter months? And so it's a time to really think differently. But summer is not the time to sit still and coast and just say, you know what, I'm not going to do anything. Um, I love what my, my friend Tom Cheney says, you know, you, you got to do something 
if anything, do something, a little nudge here and a little nudge there, do something, but just don't sit there. And, and I, I always think about what, what if it is possible uh, that you can grow your church through the summer? That, that you can take steps forward in the summer, that you can look at summer a little bit differently and maybe not the same way you do for the rest of the year, but you have a different perspective of what summer looks like. Now, here's a really crazy thing about me. When I was a kid, I loved when school got out. And I want to share this with you because I had, like I said, I had three months to ride my bike to play baseball, to have barbecues. And, and the feeling was crazy. It was like, it was a release. It was like, okay, well, we're done with that portion of my life. Now I can actually enjoy these next three months. But as a side note, you know, all, probably all the way up until fifth grade, I would come home and I'd have this weird, really weird thing that I would do. I would come home, I would kind of throw my books, uh, my school books all over my my bedroom as if I was kind of done with that. And I was, and then I would go and I would make a tuna fish with cheese, triple decker sandwich to celebrate. And I would do this year after year. It was just something that I did. Don't ask me why I don't even like tuna fish anymore, but I did this as a kid and it was the last day. It was a way for me to celebrate and to start something new. And I, I, thought back and, and God kind of brought that memory back to me. And I said, you know, uh, it's time to kind of celebrate the end of spring and to celebrate the launch of the summer. And summer was just amazing. And so as we get into this webinar, when you think of revitalizing your summer, I want you to think of one word. I'm going to pause, dramatic pause, one word. Here's the word, fun, F-U-N fun. It's about fun. And so what I want to do is I want to walk through this acronym of fun. And I want us to kind of have a little dialogue and maybe some creativity in the sense of, hey, maybe we can do that in our church. Maybe we can try something different in our church uh, because you only have three months, right? And so you want to make sure that you create a strong pathway because once those three months are over, you're going to be right into your fall and you have to make sure that this stuff that you do in the summer is going to dump into fall and it's going to start momentum. And you're going to be able to build off of what you're doing in the summer to lead you into a great fall. And so uh, F is the first one. It stands for form new connection opportunities. So that's the first thing you want to do. People are busier than ever before in the summer. And so now what you want to do is you want to leverage that for new connection opportunities. This means on and off your campus. So this means that don't have so many events on your campus. Move your events off your campus. Try to have connection points off your campus and have people lead those events. And so when I think about the summer, I think about it's a great way um, for one to, as the pastor, to start a new teaching series or what we call at our church, a new collection. Um, some questions kind of came in uh, before the webinar and a lot of people wanted to know, you know, what, what can we teach on? What, what would be a great topic? What could we do that's different than we normally don't do in June, July and August? Well, in the past, I've, I've done different types of talks. You know, what, one of the popular talks that uh, we did, and we did it for two years in a row, is we kind of played off the whole Marvel thing. Uh, when Marvel came out, it was a big deal, Hulk and, and Iron Man, and go ahead and name your favorite Captain America and Spider-Man and all this stuff. So basically what I did was, is I just started to think about, okay, who, who are the superheroes of the Bible? You know, outside of Jesus himself, who, who, who were the people that God used in the Bible in a powerful way? And so we kind of made it fun. Um, we, we took, you know, Wonder Woman, we, we called her, you know, we translated Wonder Woman into Mary. Um, and then we took guys like Hulk and we talked about Samson and we walked through the Bible there. And so the reason why I did that was because summer is such a transient time. So people are in and out. And so to do a full-blown book study can be really, really hard. 
And so what we wanted to try to do is we wanted to open up dialogue for people to kind of come in, check things out and kind of get one message, a complete message, and then go back and say, hey, I want to come back for the next week and hear about this next character. And so we did a thing called Marvel uh, that went over really, really well. You can kind of check check out online kind of what we did. And I'll be more than happy to help you in, uh, with, with anything that we've done to help you if you are interested in that. Um, I know other churches that do uh, collections called, you know, God on film, um, uh, other things, hot topic, uh, hot topics of the Bible, uh, characters of the Bible, a- anything that you can do to kind of break things up and to make it fun would be good because people who are on church, they need to kind of relate to something that maybe they don't know what, you know, church is. And I know at least in my context, in my church, we have people that don't even understand our Christianese words. And so the things that we do is we really have to kind of unchristianize in, in our vocabulary and break things down so people can say, oh, I understand that. I get that to take their next step with the Lord and, and their walk with Christ. And so we really think through uh, methodically kind of how we're doing that. Um, Another thing that we're doing, this is going to start here in the next couple of weeks is I'm just taking the month of June and we're going to do a a collection in Proverbs. I'm going to call it living wisely. And I'm going to take four different topics um, in Proverbs, whether it's on, um, you know, love, mercy, alcohol. I, I'm not really sure of my topics yet, but uh, I'm, I'm kind of still zoning and praying those down and seeing what God wants to do there. But I'm going to take four weeks and I'm going to kind of walk through um, some of these proverbs, you know, choose, making the right choices, things like that. Now, something that we do in August is is different. Every church does things differently and that's okay. Um, but for August, what we're going to do is we do it every single year is we call it on mission. We've been doing this for a number of years now, probably going on six, seven years now, where August and pretty much into the first week of September is a total missions focus. So we we focus globally and also locally. Uh, what are we doing around the world? What is you know, what the people who are giving through our local church, what's what's happening with their giving. And we really kind of highlight those missionaries that we support. We have them either make a video or something and we share their testimonies. And we're we're constantly sharing about how God's working around the world and how they're making a difference. Now we do that every week in short spurts, but in August we really take our time and we bring in special guest speakers to speak on what God um, is doing. Uh, another thing that I'm doing differently is in July is um, I, I'm doing a collection where we're highlighting what God is doing around basically New England. Uh, you know, how how God, God stories, I'm calling it, God stories, like where God is speaking into. And so we're going to highlight some of the great things that God is doing around New England. And we're going to have some of those people come in and speak and share uh, what God is doing. And so we're really breaking up the three months, June, July, and August. Now, this is something I'm trying differently. We've never done that before. Usually I take a, a collection in June and I usually run it into July and then June and July go together and August is separate. But this time I'm trying something different and it's okay. And so June, July, and August. And so that's maybe something you want to try with your, your teaching collection to try to bring maybe new people in as an interest. Um, another thing, if you're taking notes, is that you want to try to birth. And I'm using this word birth. I don't like to use the word start uh, because with start comes a finish, birth. Uh, gives life. And so I like to birth new meetup groups. Now, meetup groups is something that we do um, in our context where it's really for people who go to our church, but they have a context that they can speak into. So for instance, maybe it's a motorcycle group and all the guys who ride motorcycles, they're going to have a meetup group. So they're going to post this meetup group on an, on an events page. And they're going to say, Hey, our goal is to find other bikers and we're going to ride together over the summer. And we are going to, our goal is going to lead whoever God brings to us. We're going to try to lead those people to Christ. 
And so these people will have meetup groups. It could be mechanics groups. It could be a single mom's group. It could be a fostering group where parents get together who are fostering children, um, any type of meetup group outside of the church. And so basically what that does is that gives your people permission to lead and to evangelize. And I think it's funny because even though people know that they should evangelize, many people think they don't have the permission from their pastor to do that without asking permission as if they can do it. And so a lot of people, when I'm talking to church people, they're like, well, I don't know if we're allowed to do that. I'm like, uh, you have permission from Jesus to reach people. So go reach people. And so I try to make it very, very clear that people have permission to reach the people God has uh, placed them within their context. And so it really centers around special interest groups for people to invest and invite people into a conversation around Jesus. And so new groups come with new leaders. And so what's really cool about this is that in a meetup group, you might have a really strong volunteer and they know their story really well. Um, They're able to explain how Jesus has worked in their life and they can explain that to people. And out of that, you know, another person might be in that group and they all of a sudden God speaks to them and says, you know, you can do that too. And now all of a sudden they, they have the possibility of leading their own meetup group. And now what happens is, is now you have a birth. So out of one group, one leader looks at another leader and says, I think I can do that. And then that leader looks down and says, no, you can share your story. We eat workshop, study and play. And now all of a sudden that person says, well, you know what? I don't really have a heart as much as you do for motorcycles, but I have a real heart for volleyball. And, uh, you know, it's quite a dichotomy. Maybe the bikers can ride to the volleyball court. I don't know. But that person will say, you know what? I- I'm going to reach volleyball people for Jesus. And then that person starts a meetup group in the summer and they meet at a park somewhere and they agree to, to meet up and to play and to, and to have conversations around Christ. But new groups birth new leaders. And so what you want to do as the pastor is that you want to celebrate what people are doing. You want to try to have those highlights. So if something good happens, you want to talk about that in your message, because this is what I know. What we celebrate gets repeated. So what gets celebrated it gets repeated and it also gets modeled. And so when people see their pastor applauding something that's going really well in the community, guess what? People begin to step up, especially during the summer. And they say, you know what? I can do that too. And I want to be part of what God is doing right in my own context. And so that's something to think about. Another thing when we're talking um, about forming new connection opportunities you want to think about maybe uh, backyard neighborhood events. Uh, We have a a woman in our church, a young adult in our church that really, um, really started this, that had this concept of saying, hey, what would it look like if we just had people opened up their backyards for the summer? And they just got together and they did these backyard kind of VBS type events uh, for kids in the neighborhood. And it started to work. And so we're going to be doing that this year. So that's something, again, that we're going to continue because it worked. And so we had people uh, that say, you know what, I want to open up my backyard. And these are people that, you know, there's no age limit. These Some of these people that are leading this are much older. And they're saying, you know what, we're going to, we're, you know, we don't have kids. We love kids. And we're going to open up our backyard. And, you know, a a younger, older couple, uh, a younger, older couple, listen to me, uh, an older couple is going to open up their backyard and they're going to say, hey, let's let's do a backyard Bible club. We're going to run it for a couple of days and we're going to see what Jesus does. Uh, That's another opportunity. Um, The tried and true always is vacation Bible school. Um, Even though some of that is kind of, you know, a lot of churches do it, maybe try to think about, okay, how can we do it differently? Um, instead of, you know, maybe vacation Bible school, as some pastors I've heard say like, oh, it's just, a, um, you know, more on the negative side. Oh, it's just babysitting other kids. And I'm like, yeah, but you have the opportunity to lead those kids to Jesus. So it's really not babysitting. And I'd rather have them in a local church than not in a local church. So so think think about that. Think about uh, vacation Bible school. And I know Sandy does a great job with that. And so reach out to her on on that stuff. Uh, Another thing you can do is you can mobilize uh, your people for missions and serve projects, serving your city. 
Uh, I think about some of our teenagers that are getting ready in just a couple of days to start this whole movement of serving. They're going to be going up to a camp, helping them get set up for uh, their camps all the way up in Maine, uh, getting the cabins clean and just serving and just being there and getting things ready for this, this organization. And, and then they're going to go and they're going to serve with Habitat for Humanity. They're going to serve a, a local skateboard park that's opening up in our area that we're really excited with another church planter. And we're going to go and help. There's food pantries and shelters. And there's there's ways that you can step out into your community and uh, mobilize that. Now, when you do that, uh, I want you to understand this provides a new on ramp for new people. So people that might not be serving in your church might just jump on board and say, you know what, I think I can do that. I think I can help. And so what you don't want to do is you don't want to close people out from helping. You want them to help, but you have to give them a time and a task and let them know kind of their boundaries of, of how and, you know, how they're going to serve and when they're going to serve and, and, and kind of what was their start time and their end time. And you provide new opportunities, new on-ramps for new people to get involved in your church. So that way that brings a, a type of revitalization. You know, new people tend to do that. Uh, another thing when you're forming is you want to make sure that you get in the community and connect with leaders. And so what that means as pastors, that means to, you know, have less time in your office and more time out in the community. Uh, go out to places and meet people. Uh, I say this all the time, you know, and, and I could be wrong on this, but I, I really believe, you know, the evangelism temperature, it rises and falls on the pastor. And so if the pastor is not leading people to Jesus, well, then they really can't expect their people to, you know, lead people to Jesus. If the pastor's not having gospel conversations, well, the people are not going to have gospel conversations because I share this all the time, the mood of the leaders, the mood of the team. And so this is a time for you as the pastor to get out into the community and connect with leaders. And, you know, as I said, here I am in Kansas City. I had three Uber drivers, three Uber drivers heard the gospel. I mean, that's just what happens. Uber is like the greatest way to share Jesus with people because, you know, you have a captive audience. I mean, they're not going to throw you out of the car, you know, going 80 miles an hour or whatever. They, they got to listen to you. Um, so you have, a, you have a, a really good opportunity there. But I say all that to connect with other leaders. You know, 4th of July, a lot of towns in New England have celebrations. You know, maybe try to see how your church can step into that celebration locally and just have a maybe a table or or just a part in maybe the celebration of what your town is doing or, or your your hamlet, like wherever you're at. And, and to really make that a time of community celebration and, and invite your church to come out to it and, and be a part of it. Another thing uh, that you can do with your church is this is kind of radical and, and, you know, some of you are going to be like, what, you know, cause you might be here too, but help a struggling church. Um, you know, I remember in our, our early years when we were, when my wife and Jenna and I, when, when we were starting our revitalization, I remember we, we, we didn't have, we had very little money. We were going through all sorts of hardship, um, really trying to work hard through things that, you know, we, we were just trying to figure out. And, and I remember one of the first things I did was I said, okay, well, we're going to raise money for a church plant. And I remember the, the kickback I got, they're like, we don't even have that type of money. I said, yeah. I said, but I know this, that when we decide that we're going to give, God will give back to us. It's the law of sowing and reaping. And I trust God's word. And so, you know, helping a church get started, or maybe there's a, a, a church that needs some help, you know, and maybe they just need painters. Maybe they just need somebody to come alongside and, and, and just help, you know, and that's one of the things I love about Baptist churches in new England is that we have a great network. And, you know, I know when we all come together, uh, we can make a huge impact. So if there's a, there's something that needs to get done, um, you know, I love how churches, they just, we just come together and we celebrate together. We're not in competition with one another. We're in completion that the gospel hits every area in new England. And I love that, that we can come together and help one another in a, in a time of need. And, and so those are just some ideas. I'm sure some of you have questions, more questions. And so save those questions and put those in the chat, because I really want to try to do my best to maybe help you during our time together to kind of navigate through um, some of those. So F stands for form new connection opportunities. All right, you, 
U stands for understand the summer is for connecting and planning for the fall. Understand the summer is for connecting and planning for the fall. Now, it's easy to say, hey, it's summer. We're going to do our summer stuff. And, and we get all focused on big events. And, and, and some of those are good, but make sure you know why you're doing your events. But understand the summer is so short. And if there's one thing I kind of learned about New England, it's, it's kind of like when August starts rolling around, I start, pe- I start watching people as they start collecting wood, getting ready for the winter. It's like, it feels like summer was only like four weeks, you know? Um, but it's very interesting. Like people's mindset changes a little bit when August hits and it's like, okay, here we go. We're, we're moving right back into fall. So the window, it, at least for at least what I'm noticing, it, it feels like it's shorter than it actually is. But understand the summer is really for connecting with people make it all about connection and all about planning for the fall. And so one of the things that you can do is um, as, you, as you're taking notes, one of the things you can do is meet with your key leaders and train and plan together for the fall. Don't just go into June and say, well, it's summer. I want you to pull a, a meeting together with your leaders, whoever you have serving and dream a little bit for the fall. Say, okay, what can we do in the fall? Now, let me give you a little hint about the fall. People really don't move into fall mode until about the second week of October. And why am I saying that? Because people take last minute vacations in September. They get the last wind right before school. School starts. Things kind of shift a little bit. Parents are unsettled. The, the calendars, people trying to figure out school and college, there's all this stuff going on. But right around the second week of October, everybody settles. And so that's when you want to really plan a really strong event uh, in the community. That's when you want to kind of plant um, a really a, a really good connection point for everybody to come together to experience a, a win together to evangelize and I'll, I'll talk more about what we're going to do in the fall when I do that fall webinar but this is a great time to meet with your key leaders and to train and say okay what what book can we read together um, on whatever whatever topic it is if it's leadership if it's evangelism like whatever and 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 you know, do whatever you're reading on. So if you're reading on leadership, you know, put that into practice as you're working on it. If you're reading books on evangelism, then go evangelize. Don't just read books on it, but train and meet with your key leaders and get stronger during this time. I find it interesting that as a pastor, you know, we have a different role. It feels like we're always up to bat. It feels like we're always playing baseball. You know, when I talk to my teacher friends, they're like, oh, it's great. We're done. You know, and they and trust me, teachers work so hard. They work so hard and they're overworked and underpaid. And and I I realize that about education because I'm in it and I get it. But they get a break. They get a break to kind of rework their, you know, their their lesson plans. They get they get a chance to re, you know, rework and try to find maybe some new books, new curriculum, like whatever they're trying to work on. But the pastor He's up to bat every Sunday, every Sunday. It's like boom, 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 week after week. And so it's really important for you to kind of put a pause on that and try to bring in some special guest speakers so that you could be freed up to really pour into your staff uh, during that time. And so meet with your key leaders and love on them, pour into them, ask them the question, do you have everything you need to succeed? Is there anything that, you know, I can do for you to help you become even better at what you're doing um, and get behind them and plan together. It is so important how many pastors uh, do, you know, plan. And and it's also shocking how many pastors do not plan for the fall and they just kind of dump into the fall and they're like, well, the leaves are falling, better start doing something. I mean, that's not the time. The time is to get ready in the summer. And so, you know, one of the things that you want to do is that you want to conduct a ministry audit. Uh, That's a great time to really walk through all the ministries in your church. And then this is what you want to do. After you find out what's happening all in your church and you get a really good pulse on what's going on, and maybe you have that right now, but do an audit. And then what you need to do is you need to ask yourself the really hard questions in this audit. You need to decide what needs to go what needs to get started 
And so I, I kind of have a, a little phrase that I, I say, I haven't really shared it too much, but I say this to myself a lot, you, you know, things you want to start, you know, what are the things we want to start together as a staff? What are the things we want to stop as a staff? We need to stop doing that. Um, I, I knew a, a, a church that, you know, when I first moved into the area, they were still using flannel graph. And I'm like, I'm sure that was cutting edge in the 80s. That's not what kids are. Kids are on tablets now. So I'm sure they have flannel graph for tablets, but um, that just wasn't reaching kids. And so I said, you know, you need to stop doing that and start doing this. Um, so there's start, there's stop, and then there's pause. Now, pause for me means these are things I really want to do, but we just can't do them now but we're going to write them down so we don't lose sight of them. And then when the time comes, we're going to pull the trigger and we're going to go and we're going to move in that direction. And then this is my favorite one, bury. Like we are never doing this ever again. We tried this and it totally flopped and we're never doing this again. There's no turning back. Uh, I'm going to keep looking through the windshield, not the rear view mirror. We're going to keep moving ahead and forgot, you know, forget this ever happened. And so we have those moments as pastors where we try something and it just doesn't go well and we just bury it. But you know what? We pull our bootstraps back up. We get, get out and get moving again. And so conduct a ministry audit. I, I think that would be a, a great way to really think through a revitalization to say, you know what, how can we get started again? Uh, an, another thing that you can do is maybe join or host one big community event off campus. Now, I don't know um, everybody on this call. I know some of you, and thank you for being on here, but some pastors would love to get together and do one large event together. Uh, th there's a group of pastors in our area that that do this a lot. There's one one pastor in particular. He's he's kind of the he's a great ringleader, and he kind of brings everybody together. And he says, "Okay, guys, th this would be a great event to do." And they do this collectively as an event, um, and and everybody comes together, and, and it's just one big capital C church coming together, and they host the one big community event. That's that's a great idea, and maybe you can do something like that in your area with the intent not to get people to your church, right? But to get people to wonder and to consider walking with Jesus. And there's just, just be a blessing in your community. I mean, you could bring life and revitalization in your community. I mean, just imagine what it would look like if every church said, you know what, we're not going to be in competition with one another. We're going to complement one another and we're going to come together and we're going to be the body of Christ. Because that alone, that's what Jesus prayed for in John 17, you know, Ephesians 4. It's all about unity, the church coming together. So maybe join or host one big community event off campus. Uh, another thing that you can try is plan in the summer really strong, because if you plan in the summer, you're going to reap in the fall. And so I have this saying that if you stall in the summer, you're going to beg in the fall. If you stall in the summer, you're going to beg in the fall. But if you plan in the summer, you're going to reap in the fall. And so try to think of these connection points as just the small little uh, micro groups that are happening outside of your church to invite them to the one big event that's going to take place in October. And so you can start setting the stage now for these things and start these micro movements in your area. I think it'd be very, very powerful if you considered that because it worked for us and it is still working. And I think that's the really the wave of the future, the, the micro movement. Um, another thing to think about in this section is to make yourself available to connect. Uh, so pastor, leaders, those of you on the call, Make yourself available to connect. And trust me, I know this is so hard. My, my calendar is just so packed all the time. But you know what? I make room for people for lunches and I sit with people and I can't meet with everybody all the time. I can't meet with the same person like three times in one month, but I can meet with them at least one time and make that one hour really meaningful for them and connect with them and, and to make time with, for people who don't know Jesus you know, uh, I know of a leader that the only people he meets with, the only people he meets with is unchurched people. Um, he doesn't make any provision to meet with anybody. Now, this person's not a pastor. This person's a, a leadership guru. Um, if I said his name, you would know who he is, but he does not 
allow any kind of church talk stuff. He makes his entire calendar available because he's so packed for unchurched conversations so that he can lead people to Jesus. And so I would just want to challenge you, whatever side you're on there, to make church, to make time for people. Make time for people. So book more lunches. Book more coffee with people, spend time with people. And listen, when you're in those meetings with people, be present, be present with them. Um, Don't bring your cell phone with you. Leave your cell phone in the car in that one hour and just let it be and spend meaningful time. Because I'm telling you, people notice how present you are in the conversation and if you're busy. And so make that one hour time just really, really meaningful. So if if you're a smaller church or if you're a medium-sized church, make a list of the people that you want to connect with and put them on your calendar and make it a point to connect with them. And it doesn't have to be long. Maybe you're, maybe you're meeting with them, you know, for 30 minutes. Maybe you're meeting with them for an hour, like whatever you can give. And trust me, I know an hour is a long time because there's a lot of things as a pastor that, you know, you've got to get done. There's deadlines. I, I understand all that. But make time for people because the only thing you can bring to heaven is Jesus God's word and people. And so make room for people, especially during the summer. And especially if you're in New England, because it's really the only time you're ever going to get a chance to sit outside with people and actually have a conversation. Because many people I know do not want to sit outside in the snow and have a conversation. They'd rather be inside. So spend time with people, uh, do whatever you need to do, go golf and play tennis with people, build a relationship with them and whatever you need to do to make that happen. Number three, Um, is is the last one. And this is navigate the changes together for the fall. And so what do I mean by that? Navigate the changes together for the fall. So maybe you're the only pastor in the church. I understand that. But what would it look like if you were to be able to grab your team and to have a meeting together and to say, guys, thanks so much for coming to this meeting and I appreciate y'all being here. Listen, I, I want to brainstorm with you. What imagine with me? I, I want you all to come to this meeting with me. And 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 you know, what are some shifts that we can make in our church for the fall? What what are some things that maybe God has placed on your heart? I find it most of the time that people just want to have a voice. And so, if you can bring people together, regardless if if it's even even if it's you, your you know, your spouse, your secretary, your kids, uh, wh- whatever it is. Um, you don't have to have a mega church to have a meeting. I mean, you could bring people together and have a brainstorm meeting and it can be positive. It doesn't have to be a negative meeting. It could be positive. And you, all you need to say is, hey, we just want to dream together and what could be. And you let people share their hearts and you write it on a whiteboard and you you celebrate what they're saying and you you acknowledge what they're saying. It doesn't mean you have to do what they're saying. You're just you're just dreaming with them. And when you give people a voice, I've realized that's when creativity happens. When you're the only person in the room talking, that's when uh, people kind of shut down, kind of like what I'm doing now. I'm the only person talking on the webinar, which feels really weird because I'm a conversational person. But you know, navigate the changes together and have the conversations together of what if and imagine and let's dream together. And so what I want you to do is I want you to navigate the changes together for the fall. So think of the fall as a fresh start and the summer as a time of sharpening. And so maybe you want to strengthen your children's ministry during the summer. Well, how are you going to do that for the fall? What needs to take place? And it might even be stuff that doesn't even cost money. It might even be just maybe just cleaning up, making sure it's clean and it's not clutter, making sure the smells when you walk in, it smells friendly and it doesn't smell like, you know, mold or mothballs or anything kind of maybe offensive. (laughs) You like walk in and you're like, what does this smell? Like it's, it's refreshing. I mean, that some of that stuff doesn't cost a lot of money. I mean, paint doesn't cost a lot of money. Maybe a wall needs to be painted. Uh, there, there are so many things. I love hanging out with my kids because they're always teaching me about all these cool websites like Etsy, where you can buy uh, stickers pretty cheap and you can get stickers, big stickers for, you, you can write a scripture saying or something, you can get a sticker for your wall. I mean, you could paint a wall and put a sticker on it. It's amazing what it does uh, for not a lot of money. And, and, and so it's just think of this time as a, a fresh start and think of the summer as a, a time for sharpening. 
And so I have an acronym that I, I use a lot more for me. I don't really share this acronym. So that I'm, this is the first time I'm actually sharing it publicly. Um, but I, it's called assess, A-S-S-E-S, assess. So always seeking strategy, enlargement, sustainment. Always seeking strategy, enlargement, sustainment. That acronym is my acronym. You're not going to find it anywhere else. It's just something that's how I think. So when I'm in the summer, I'm thinking, I'm doing a lot of thinking. My wife's always like, Gary, you have to stop thinking because every time I think I get myself into another project, I get myself into another, uh, another thing. And so I always have to be careful in my thinking because I'm, I'm a thinker. I'm a futurist. It's just what I do. Um, but I always do that. I, I also look at things and I say, okay, is there a better way? How can we make this better? And so I, I run everything through my little acronym, uh, assess. And so it's always seeking strategy, enlargement, and sustainment. And so what that means is, okay, is this strategic and is this, is this worth doing? And has somebody else already done this or is this done before somewhere else? Or can we do it a different way? And how is this going to enlarge the kingdom of God? How is this going to add, um, you know, numbers to, to God's kingdom in the sense, how many people are going to get saved through this? How many people are going to come to Christ through this enlargement? Are we going to enlarge the kingdom? How many disciples are going to be made? And then sustainment. Can we actually sustain this? Is it worth sustaining? Or is it going to die out after three months? Or is this going to last the three to five years? And so I'm always asking those types of questions. And so maybe that's a little acronym for you that you can use, um, to kind of, you know, do a little brainstorming there. Uh, so the next thing is know where you want to be in the fall to chart your steps in the summer. So as you're in the summer, I want you to think long and hard about, okay, where do we want to be in the fall? What would it look like as we go into the fall? What is that going to look like? And how are we going to get there? So you're looking at the fall, but you're backing up into the summer and you're saying, okay, how do we begin the momentum? How do we move the momentum? Um, there are some areas that, that are all about, you know, growth. And we're talking about revitalizing and maximizing your summer. And so this is important. So I want you to think about these different areas. The first one is grow your people to serve more, grow your people to serve more. What do I mean by that? Well, everybody's at a certain lid level, right? They're, they're, everybody's at a certain level and a lid that, that kind of keeps them at their leadership. And so what you want to try to do is you want to challenge them to serve, in the summer. And you want to challenge them to serve their community. And, and, and so what, what, what I love about that, th th these are things that can get done. May maybe it's a local business. Maybe they just need a wall painted. Uh, may maybe they just need trash cleanup on the highway. I mean, there's so many different things. Like one year we, we cleaned up local parks. Um, th these are just simple things that we can go out as a church body and just go do, and it doesn't cost money, but yet we're serving in the community. And then people are going to say, why are you picking up that trash? I know in new England, people are like, why are you picking up trash? Uh, they ask a lot of questions, um, because we love our community and we want to, you know, we're, we're here to serve and, oh, wh who are you people? Oh, well, we're, we're with city United. Oh, okay. Um, you know, these are just opportunities that, that you can do. Uh, another thing is grow your people to give more to missions. I find that, you know, the summer is a great, great way to introduce global and local missions to people because it's an easy uh, on-ramp for people to get moving right now. They can do something right now. And so tell your people, okay, how, how can you, you know, give more to missions? And may, maybe it's not just to, you know, some of us that might be on this call or, 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 or in Southern Baptist circle. Uh, some of us might be from a, from a different circle, maybe ARC or something like that. But understand that this summer is a time for being mission all and doing missions and, and giving to, you know, to local mission projects and to helping church planners and to helping people um, go further faster by your efforts. And this can help your people in the, in your church to get on board and do greater and bigger things. Um, so that's something to think about. Another thing to think about is grow your people to pray more in your neighborhood. I had a friend that really rocked my world. Um, I don't want to name drop, but, but we had a conversation and he challenged me with a question and I was like, wow, like I just kind of, 
I answered the question, no, I have not done that. And the question was, Gary, I know you spend a lot of money, you know, reaching people around the world and, and in your local community. And I'm like, yep, yep, yep. He goes, have you ever considered reaching the 100 people around your church? And I said, well, we, we, we've done mailings. He says, no, 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 that's not what I'm asking you. I'm asking you, have you prayed and gone and knocked on the hundred doors around your church and bless those people with something? And I said, no. And he says, well, it's time. And I said, wow. And we did. And we put together teams and they went out. We put together these gift baskets for our community with a, with a mug and, and candy. Like we did this little thing that we just put together and, and we had people put the baskets, really nice baskets. And we just knocked on our door and we said, Hey, we're, we're your neighbor. And we want to let you know we're here and we appreciate you so much. And, and we just loved on our community. And then we, we prayed over these homes and, and it was powerful. And another thing, um, some of you might have heard about the um, the great thing. One, one of my my friends, Sam Rayner and, and Tom Rayner, they 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 put together this great thing at Church Answers called Pray and Go. It's a great resource. Uh, we've we've used this in our church, where um, all you do is you find your neighborhood and you pray through your neighborhood. You prayer walk your neighborhood. And you put people together and they don't even have to talk to anybody. They, they don't even have to, you know, have a conversation. If it happens, great. But you mobilize people to have a heart for their community. And I teach us all the time. You move towards what you pray towards. And so if people are going to have a heart for their community, they've got to pray for their community. They got to pray around the streets of their community. And they have these little door hangers that you can maybe put on a mailbox or something like that. And, and you know, and just let people, hey, we prayed for you today. Um, I, I've heard incredible stories of, of people around America doing this, and it's just great. And so it's called Pray and Go. It's, it's a great resource. You can check it out. I think it's on Church Answers. Um, it's a great, great resource. But challenge your people to pray more in your neighborhood. The, the other thing is give your people permission. I alluded to this before. Give your people permission to lead with a blessing to start something new and own it. One of the things I've realized, if I've learned anything in these, these past going on 10 years now of revitalizing, is I've learned that when you give people a blessing as a pastor and you give them permission to go and to own something, they take responsibility for it and they run with it and they, they do it. And, and I'm not talking about anything heretical. I'm just talking about people, if they have a passion to read something, you as the pastor need to give the people permission and say, you have my permission to go do this. If it's reaching people in the basketball courts, you have my permission. If it's reaching people in the hockey rings, you have my permission. Like you let people know that and you say that over and over again and you challenge people to lead people in a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And so the last one I'm going to leave you with is use the summer to write your next six months out. What do I mean by that? I'm giving you some insight into my life, um, kind of what I do as a pastor. Uh, I use the time not just to revitalize my neighborhood and revitalize people, but I have to revitalize myself. And it's really, really important because so many pastors keep running on empty and that's a great book, by the way. Wayne Cordero wrote a book called Running on Empty. Uh, it's an incredible book. You need to get it. It's a little outdated, but it's still good. Um, that was free, by the way. But this is really, really good because you want to take time to grow yourself. And I've told this to people. God's more interested in growing you than he is growing your church. And But you've got to sit at Jesus's feet. And you've got to hear from God. You've got to hear from up on high. You've got to hear what God's calling you to preach on and where God's calling you to lead. And if you just keep going from event to event to event, you're not hearing from God. You're really hearing from people in your calendar. But you need to kind of come apart before you come apart. And you need to get away so you can hear God's voice. And so one of the things I do, and I take very, very seriously, and I protect this time, is in the summer, I take a break. Uh, this is going to be actually my first summer 
where I'm taking four weeks off. Now I told my friend this today. I said, yeah, I'm taking a sabbatical. I'm taking four weeks off. And they said, four weeks. I said, we give our pastor like 10 to 15 weeks off. I said, well, I'm really not there yet. That sounds great. They said, yeah, it's in our constitution. And of course they're a mega church. I'm like, of course you guys can have your pastor take off. I can't take off for that long. So by, by God's grace, I have some people going to be speaking for me during that time so I can find rest, but I always take two weeks off in the summer. And what I do is, is during those two weeks, I write a yearly preaching calendar. So what I do is, is I get the 2023 calendar and I write out and I hear and I pray and I get with God and I say, God, where are you speaking in our church? And maybe where are the problems and the pitfalls and the potentials in our church? And God speak to me and God gives me my, my, basically my preaching calendar, what he wants me to preach on for the entire year. And so I rough draft that out. And, you know, the person that really got me started on this was a guy by the name of uh, Nelson Searcy. And, um, you know, this is probably about 15 years ago. And Nelson was a really young church planner starting a church in New York City. And, and now he's, you know, he, he, he's done incredible things around the country. But, but Nelson really challenged me on putting together a preaching calendar. And, and I, I'm pretty sure he still does webinars on this. I guarantee he does. I, I, I think I might've saw some now if it was old, but, but look for his name, Nelson Cersei preaching calendar. It's a great resource that really uh, leveraged uh, me hearing from God. I kind of took what he said and took it like way further than kind of what he said for my own benefit, just so I can grow. But I take that year and I just write out my entire year. And so in there, one of the things I do is I make sure I put all my resting points in the calendar. That's the first thing that goes in there are my Sabbaths. They all go in there. I take my Sabbath on a Friday, Friday's a day off. That's my time to kind of recharge. And then what I do is we, my wife and I, we say, okay, when's our, when's our family vacation? Family vacation goes on there. Then after that, our date nights go on there. Okay. When do we want to get away? What are the important things? And then now this is shocking. And then we say, okay, When are the church events going on there? Then the church events go on there. And then from there, then I add where God's calling me to to lead and to preach from. I get away with God and I start mapping out um, all the collections that we're going to do for the year. Because I view the preaching calendar as kind of baking a cake. Uh, God, what, what books are you calling me to preach through? Uh, where are you leading me to preach? And it's like different ingredients that are going to help grow the people of the church, grow them closer to Christ. So a preaching calendar is really, really important. And so what I do in that calendar is I put my big rocks in for the church. So four different events that we do each year, those go in. We try to do four, three to four big events each year. Those go in the calendar. And that's important. Um, also, uh, as I kind of bring this to a close, I want to leave definitely room for questions here. I know we're going to probably go over, but I'm, I just like to just leave room for questions is make sure you're in some type of cohort. Uh, do not go through life alone. Do not go through pastoring alone. Do not go through revitalization alone. Make sure that you're in some type of network like the Baptist churches of New England and like the revitalization cohorts, do not go through life alone. I know now many people are in many different cohorts all over America. Many people are in three to four. That's good. But make sure that you have a family, you have a team and a tribe uh, to make sure that they have your back. And so I know that that BCN is one of those tribes. And so I'm going to end this webinar now, and I'm just going to leave room for questions and I'll stay on as long as everybody needs me to be. So thanks so much for having me, Sandy. And this has just been a, a great, great time together. Gary, thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it. And um, I think you hit on a lot of the questions. Um, Say a little bit, though, about volunteers. You know, a few people um, had, um, you know, mentioned that they really struggle with um, finding volunteers, especially in the summertime. Uh, Because I think sometimes uh, not only pastors feel like, um, you know, I'm going to take the summer off, but so do volunteers. So how do you engage them? Yeah, so that's a really, really deeper question, but I, I can at least tell you that you, you're going to have your people, right? They're, they're going to be people that are going to serve for a time and a season, and they're going to jump off on you, but there are also those people that are always going to have have your back and stay with you, and so you just need to really over-communicate um, from the stage and say, hey, um, I know it's summer. 
but maybe introduce, this is just an idea and I'm thinking off the cuff here. Yep. Maybe, maybe it's a great idea for you to actually have kind of a short summer contractual agreement to say, Hey, would you sign up for the next eight weeks? Would you commit to the next eight weeks, June and July and August or whatever it is, the, the 16 weeks or whatever, like whatever it is, you make the contract as long as you need it for me and have that person sign it and say, look, I need you to commit to these next 16 weeks and have them sign it and get them on board. And then you're going to know that they're committed. But if you don't have an an agreement and people can kind of come and do whatever they want, guess what? They're going to do whatever they want. But if you make it clear and you say, hey, um, I know you guys have been serving really, you know, a a lot. And and if I could just ask you maybe to, uh, you know, let me know when your vacations are so I know how to plan. And then can you do me a favor? Can you find a fill in for me? somebody that you're connected with, because what I find is the pastor's like the salesman. Uh, here goes the pastor again, selling something else, or he doesn't have a leader, but it's even more powerful when that leader who is serving, you go and you find three or four other people and then bring those people to the pastor and say, hey, pastor, we're going on vacation, but I have Sally, Mary, and Joe and Phil, they're all going to serve. They, they're going to fill in for me. So don't worry about it. We, we got it. Those are some great, great ways you can do that in the summer. Yeah, and I appreciated what you said about the mood of the pastor. You had some of, when it comes to evangelism, and I wonder if it's kind of the same principle with people volunteering. If they if they see your passion for um, you know how important the summer is, yeah. um, perhaps that would help them stay engaged. Yeah, a- absolutely, absolutely. I I don't you know we don't take we don't stop groups we don't take off. Um, we don't say, okay, it's summer, everybody go on break. No, we're like, Hey, it's summer. Let's ramp it up. Uh, (laughs) You know, uh, but, but however, as a church, we do let our church people know that, you know, we, it's like clockwork the week after Thanksgiving, we meet online the week after Christmas, we meet online. So everybody, we, we put stops in our calendar. So we're not okay. Okay, going and going. And so people know like, okay, that's family time. And we make time for the family, but we also say, look, we still have to minister. Right. We're still ministering. It's not a club, you know, it's a, it's a call. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Jesus never took a vacation either. <laughs> I, I don't think he's on vacation right now. either. So. <laughs> right. But that's a great idea um, about making, um, uh, good stops for your church. And I like that idea about the online choosing a couple of times. So that way you don't have to have your volunteers for kids ministry or anything. You just take those hard stops and, and you really bless everybody at the same yeah. time. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And I might, I might want to bring on my wife. Uh, she's the director of operations at our church yeah. in the fall webinar. And we yeah. can really talk about what operations side looks like. She's really, really good at that too. Yeah, that would be really good. I think people would really appreciate that. Yeah, she, she keeps so. our church going. That's the truth. I'm, she keeps I'm our church sure. moving ahead and catches every ball that's dropping and makes sure, yeah. you know, where, where people are and uh, really frees me up to uh, do what I can do. And right. so, you know, yes. a really good, a really good person that you can have alongside of you is really important. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, you know, you talk about Sabbath um, and, uh, and I'm sure that you teach your volunteers the same thing, that they that it's OK. You give them permission to take their time off when they need to take time off. Yeah. And, and the reality is, Sandy, most of our people like this is this is crazy. Right. So most of our people in our churches are only probably serving one hour a week at our church, right? Like right. one hour. When I talk to parents that are driving their kids from soccer game to soccer game, they're giving like 20 hours to this thing. And they'll turn around and they'll say to me, well, pastor, I'm, I'm, I'm exhausted. I don't know if I can serve it. I'm like, you're only doing this for one hour. Like you can't give one hour. To, you know, so I'm kind of scratching my head on that thing. But also, you know, we we ha- we started two gatherings with the intention to serve one, sit one, serve right. one, sit one. And so those of you that might not have two gatherings, you know, this could be another webinar for later, but maybe you want to do your recording night a different night and let all your volunteers go to that as their leader church service as you're recording and you have a person that you're speaking to on camera and then post produce it. And then on Sunday, they're serving, you know, right. and, and they're sitting, they're hearing the message, but they're also serving at the same time. And that's how you kind of get around that one, one service a weekend thing. Right. Yeah. Great, 
good right good idea and that may need to be another webinar because i yeah, think yeah, yeah that might that might help people too and i like the idea of um you know, you mentioned backyard Bible clubs um, that you're doing at your church. And sometimes maybe we need to go rethink of some things that we've done in the past that, you right. know, worked, but we kind of let them go because we didn't have volunteers. Yeah. And, you know, some of those things don't take as much manpower as, you know, some of these bigger events that we're doing. Absolutely. So I think thinking about those things, so I, I really you know, appreciated um, that big time. So, so that was great. So anybody else, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, I think Gary, you covered a lot of great ideas there. Love the idea about your preaching topics. Many people asked about preaching topics. So I think you gave them a great idea. And I assume you brand those uh, in some shape or form. Um, you know, uh, and, and publicize them and promote them? Do you do anything yeah. special with those? No. So, so I don't make money off of anything I create. I, I just don't believe in that. I mean, there's churches that literally will take my, I, you know, I don't know why they do this, but some churches do that. And you have my permission. So just, you can go to cityunited.church mm -hmm. and all the discussion, all my message notes are on there. All the topics are on there. Um, bumper videos, you know, if we've created those, we'd be more than happy to share those with you. Um, you know, some of the ones we can't share because those are, those are copywritten and we've paid for those. And so there's a register right there that we can't do, but a lot of our stuff we create ourselves. and, um, yeah, you know, Jana put that, yeah, Jana put that in the chat. So, Thank you. so if people can, can get that, that's good. But uh, what I'm talking about a little bit is, um, so when you promote your, um, you know, oh. when you're promoting it, um, you know, do you, you know, you do some kind of splashy and kind of help people to, it really catches people attention um, when you do your, your, your series, your collections. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we do really, you know, we advertise like obviously with we'll do email blast, text blast. We'll talk about it as I'm ending one, um, one collection, I'll be mentioning it. Probably if I'm if if I'm three if I'm three weeks out from the new collection, I'll start mentioning it, gotcha. getting people's hearts prepared, yep. and the graphics and stuff will start going up. We'll start advertising that on online, and people know like that's what we're talking about. Right. And so that's in house stuff, and right. and then also online outhouse stuff. But um, yeah, fa I mean Facebook, social, all that stuff is is really important. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons probably that you have that schedule way in advance so that you can do those promotions. Yep. And somebody just put here, uh, Wilson, Kathy Thomas, you, you guys put uh, supervision of children, background checks, absolutely 100%. Um, our, our church, you know, uses, I can't remember the, uh, the company we use, but uh, maybe Jen, if you're still there, you can pop that in of who we use, but everybody goes through a background check. Absolutely. 100% uh, ministry safe. There it is, Jesse. Thank you. Uh, we use them. Everybody gets certified. And then it's a, it puts parent at ease. Uh, it's huge. Yep. And then also if you're doing backyard clubs, you might want to have somebody running some security too. Yeah. And do a little training on first aid, you know, yep. making sure you, everybody can understand that. Our church uses a, a company called Sterling Volunteers. They're very good. Um, and also if you're in Massachusetts, you also have to do what they call a uh, Corey check. So not only do you do a national background check, but you need to do the Corey check. So there's two different checks if you're in Massachusetts. I don't know any of the New England states that have that, but Massachusetts has that. So a lot of people think you just do the Corey and you're good to go. But Corey is only for Massachusetts and it only looks through the court system in Massachusetts. It does not go any further than that. So that's why it's so important to do a national background check. And one of the things I would say too, and I bet you have this on your website, is we tell people that all of our uh, children's volunteers are background checked and trained. And because would you, wouldn't you say that um, your website is people's first entree into your church? Yeah, it's the, it's the new lobby. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so important to do that. So good. Good. Very good. Well, thanks again, Gary. Thanks. I hope you're having a good time in Kansas City and we'll see you when you get back. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks so all much right. for coming in. God all bless right. you all. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.